kind of like what I told you guys about when it was just rogue. <laughs> yeah. And so I had to like, I was like, oh my God. Okay. So that, um, with the gown, you know, you can tie it. So I was like trying to tie it in the front, but I mean, cause she only had one, she didn't have two. So when we got to the x-ray room, we took the, we took the sheet and just covered her. So like, we don't want to see all that. <laughs> yeah. So we just <laughs> take the sheet and just cover her. But I mean, I told her, I was like, I told her, only remove the pants. Like, I even pointed to the pants and she just decided to take everything off. I was like, that, Sorry, it's a little loud back here, but. Uh, that's okay. That will happen quite often <laughs> where they just disrobe in front of you like that. But it sounds like you handled it pretty well. So mm -hmm. good. Good job. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So let's see. I guess I got to tell a story as well. Usually I got like 3,000 I can tell. Let's see. Let me go into the archive here for a second. The mental archive. Ah, okay. So this is a good one since we just got through doing upper extremities of the hand and fingers, form and elbow and wrist. So I got called to do a finger x-ray in the EC one night. And I went into the room. It was on a four-year-old little boy. And I walk in, it was on his, um, his second digit. So I walk over to get set up for the x-ray with my portal machine. And I noticed he didn't have a finger, like he was missing his finger. So, I mean, completely missing, like completely amputated. So I was like, um, so just to make sure you guys want a second digit, correct? You don't want just a whole hand because your patient is missing his finger. They're like, oh, no, we still want the second digit. It's right there. So I look over on the tray by the table and sure enough there's his finger on a block of ice that had been amputated so i said you want me to x-ray the amputated finger yeah yeah we've had it on ice and we're pretty confident we can reattach it we want to make sure there's no major fractures on the finger so I said, okay um your uh your wish is my command uh let me let me see what i can do here so i went and retrieved the finger it was very cold it was very clammy it was very weird and it was really hard to describe what it feels like holding a severed finger. It's a very strange feeling. But I positioned that severed finger in a beautiful PA, a 45-degree oblique, and a true lateral on that amputated finger. And it was quite lovely. It was quite spectacular. And there were no fractures on that finger, and they did successfully reattach it. But that was really weird. If um, you ever get to experience holding a severed limb or severed finger, it's a very unnatural feeling because it doesn't have any temperature to it. It's um, it's just it's very strange. And yes, I did wear gloves. I, I could feel through the gloves though. It was very very weird, very weird. But that was my finger. I had to tell the story again. Wait, what? I said you had to tell the story again. Well, yeah, that's a good one. That's <laughs> such what they're talking about fingers and hands. Don't worry, I got lots more good ones coming. You ain't heard nothing yet. Yeah. I mean, wait till we get to the soft tissue butt x-ray. The sunrise soft tissue butt x-ray. I'm saving that one for a later, later date. Yes, that was a real exam. Soft tissue butt. Real x-ray. All right. So, well, so overall, guys, with clinic, it is it starting to feel a little more natural now that you've been in there a few weeks? Like you kind of get into a routine a little bit. You're understanding things a little more. You've had some more of the hands on with actual patients. Is it feeling more comfortable overall or is it still feeling a little awkward? Starting to kind of ease into it more. Feeling like That's probably saying it's a little bit awkward because it's like you're new. You're trying to still figure out where things are. But after the first day, it gets easier. Oh, how's the, how's the new lab room? I haven't got to see it yet. The new lab y'all guys are you guys are going to is it pretty decent i haven't got to see that facility yet it's smaller than quinton means for sure um, so you feel the overcrowdedness more okay okay but it gets the job done it's the main thing <laughs> good okay well i do realize i am the one thing holding you guys from your weekend so let's get to our lesson so we can get to that weekend a little quicker, yes? I think we're all ready for that.
All right, let me go ahead and pull up the PowerPoint, and we are going to go into shoulder girdle anatomy today. Shoulder girdle anatomy. Knowledge is power. You are correct. So you really want me to take my time? I mean, you know, I'll, I'll go super slow. We'll use every minute here today. I don't mind taking my time. You know, I get excited when I talk about anatomy. So I'm going to start talking a little fast, so you know, I can slow it on down. So chapter five, guys, this is going to focus primarily upon the humerus and the shoulder girdle, which comprises quite a few bones, quite a few pieces of new anatomy, new landmarks, new joints, all of the above. And some of that humerus anatomy we have already went over, primarily the distal portion of the humerus. We're going to talk a little bit about that again, because it, that elbow and that humerus and that forearm area all do overlap quite a bit. But humerus and shoulder girdle will be our primary focus for this chapter. Not quite as much information as the last chapter, so it's a little bit shorter overall. But that's a that's a calm before the storm when we get to the lower extremity, which is going to increase in a lot more anatomy. So it's kind of like a little break in between the heavy information here on this chapter. So when we talk about the shoulder girdle, guys, we are primarily focused upon the region where we have the clavicle all the way down to the distal humerus. So that shoulder girdle and humeral area, the primary area we're talking about in Chapter 5 is from the clavicle down to the distal humerus. So like I said, there is going to be a little overlap here because we did talk a little bit about that humerus in the last chapter because we did talk quite a bit about the elbow. So some of that anatomy you already know. It's a good thing. And speaking of which, there's a few of them right there. That's not all of them, of course. But make sure that's staying in your memory because we're going to see a lot of this same anatomy come back again this chapter even on your image reviews as well, on your tests. A lot of the same exact stuff can be seen again. We may have to relabel it. So, for example, looking at H here, that's pointing to the olecranon process of that ulna. Just a little review here. A is going to be that medial epicondyle. F is the lateral epicondyle. B, of course, is going to be our trochlea, which is that region right there on the humerus. To the left of it right here is that capitulum area followed by the head of the radius, neck of the radius, and that trochlear notch found right here on the ulna. So a lot of overlap there. We're going to see the same exact anatomy when we talk about humerus when we do our humerus x-rays, because as you guys know in lab already, when you're doing humerus x-ray, you're not just doing the proximal portion, you're also including that distal portion all in one nice image overall, or you should be at least having it all in one image. Some texts would argue against that because they get lazy, but we do need the entire humerus on those x-rays. Definitely, if you're having trouble with this elbow anatomy, make sure you're going back and reviewing that because that is going to come up in this chapter as well. Now, the three main bones of that shoulder girdle are going to be what we call the clavicle, which is our collarbone, the scapula, and, of course, that humerus once again. So that layman's term for clavicle, like I said, is going to be what we call the collarbone. Most people will refer to it as that, but our scientific name would be clavicle. Clavicle is quite often fractured. In fact, when you guys get through with this chapter in lab, that's a really excellent comp to get because people come in with clavicle x-rays on clavicle fractures all the time. Very easy bone to break, very fragile bone overall. Held together by two distinct joints, which we're going to start specifying here in a little bit. So even though this looks like a very small area, and it kind of is because we're just primarily dealing with the shoulder area, there is quite a bit of anatomy in that small little area that we have to make sure that we recognize as far as those bony landmarks go. So let's start with our proximal humerus. Here's some new stuff right here. We'll start at the very top, which would be our most proximal portion. So we have the head of the humerus. The head of the humerus is ball-shaped. It's a round sphere. Thus, it fits into that joint space, forming that ball and socket joint. So the head of humerus will be rounded, spherical, and ball-shaped. It's very easy to identify on an x-ray. Now, as we move inferior or more distal, we have what's called the anatomic neck. The anatomic neck is found right below the head of the humerus. That's very important to remember because when we talk about the humerus, it has two necks. Let's say again, the humerus has two necks. It has an anatomical neck and a surgical neck. 
And we have to make sure you know the difference between both because we can identify both on our x-rays. So we'll skip, on the, skip over these two varices for a second and go to that other neck. So you'll see we have the anatomic neck right underneath the head. We have the surgical neck a little more distal on the humerus right underneath the tubercles. So there's a surgical neck under the tubercles, anatomic neck under the head. Now let me ask you a question. Why do you think on the humerus we identify this as the surgical neck? There's a very particular reason for that. Why do we call it the surgical neck? You might want to wager a guess. Because it gets broken a lot that spot? Exactly right. That's the most frequently fractured spot on a humerus. That is why it's identified as a surgical neck, because that's more often than not where they'll actually perform surgeries. How would they repair that? They're going to put rods in the humerus, actual metallic rods going in that humerus to repair that fractured area. Now let me move back up again. So we have two very prominent tuberosities on the humerus, on that proximal portion. We have what's called the greater tubercle or tuberosity. By the way, you can see those terms interchangeably. Tubercle and tuberosity can both be used for the same exact thing. We have the greater tubercle or tuberosity on the lateral aspect of the humerus. On the more medial aspect of the humerus, we have the lesser tubercle or tuberosity. And both of these can be identified on our x-rays. In fact, when we're going from an AP to a lateral humerus or an external internal rotation shoulder, we're looking at those greater and lesser tubercles to be in profile. For example, if I do an external rotation shoulder, I'm bringing my hand outward, as you guys learned in lab, I'm gonna put my greater tubercle in profile. When I do my internal rotation, where I bring my hand inward, I'm gonna put my lesser tubercle in profile. So that's one of those landmarks we can look at to make sure that shoulder is actually positioned correctly. Same thing for the humerus. When I do an AP humerus, I should see my greater tubercle in profile. When I do a lateral humerus, I will see my lesser tubercle in profile. Once again, we're using that particular anatomy to make sure that, that humerus or shoulder is positioned correctly. Now, in between both the tubercles, the greater and the lesser, we have what's called the intertubular groove. Very tubular. You know, like the 90s, if you grew up in the 90s, they should say tubular, tubular a lot. One of those 90s words. Doesn't ring a bell for anybody. The inter, okay, one person. The intertubular groove is an actual indentation found right between the greater and lesser tubercle. It also goes by the synonymous term of bicipital groove. So as you guys know by now, oftentimes these pieces of anatomy do have dual names. You can always use either one, whichever one you're comfortable with. I like intertubular groove just because it sounds a lot more groovy. You know, it's tubular and groovy. Sounds silly, but you won't forget it now. It's a tubular and a groovy notch between the tubercles. Yes, yes it is. But do make sure, make note, that is found between both of those tubercles. It is a literal indentation that we'll actually see on the x-rays when we move forward here. So as we travel more distally down that humerus, there is another indentation or tubercle slash tuberosity called the deltoid tuberosity. A little harder to see on x-rays, but it is another prominent um, protrusion on the shaft of that humerus, more closer to the proximal end. So I think it's a pretty easy answer. Those of you that exercise and know muscles, what do you think the point of that deltoid tuberosity is? What's your best guess? The deltoid attaches to it? The deltoid muscle attaches to it, exactly right. The ligament's actually attached there. Very good. And then, of course, as you move down to that central portion of that humerus, that's going to be what we call the body or the shaft of the humerus. We've had that word a lot with all of our anatomy. Most anatomy, will, especially the long bones, will have those shaft or body areas. So humerus has that as well. So that's our main piece of anatomy on our humerus. And I would say all of these pieces of anatomy, with the exception of the deltoid tuberosity, is very easy to identify and see on our x-rays. So we do want to focus on every single one of these. Probably the one people mix up the most out of these pieces of anatomy are going to be that anatomic neck versus surgical neck. So make sure you can tell the difference between those two areas. They are in two different locations. Anatomic right under the head, surgical under the tubercles, greater and lesser. And that's what it would look like on an x-ray right there. So without me saying anything, I mean, you can kind of see the position there on the right. 
But if you were just looking at the x-ray, what do we have in profile on that x-ray? Who wants to tell me, based on the anatomy we just talked about and what I just mentioned? What's in profile very prominently? There are two ripple. Which one? The lesser. The lesser, are you sure about that? No, I don't know. <laughs> So this is going to be the greater tubercle in profile on this x-ray. We're going to learn more how to identify that moving on because they do have two very prominent distinct shapes. But you can see this patient on the right is in that external rotation shoulder position where we have the hand turned outward. And remember what I said, when we have the external rotation, we are putting that greater tubercle in profile. Here we have it right here. Pointer. Right here where B is pointing. That greater tubercle is in profile. So based on the anatomy we just talked about, what do you think C is referring to? Well, actually, let me let me let me let me change that. Let me go in a different order here. B is the greater tubercle. What do you think D is? The lesser tuberosity. The lesser tubercle or tuberosity, correct? And that's a key feature of that external rotation or AP humerus. The greater tubercle or tuberosity is in profile, while the lesser tubercle or tuberosity is on the, eight, the anterior aspect of the humerus, superimposed right there on the anterior surface. So with that being said, we identified both tuberosity or tu tuberosities. What do you think this line here is that C's pointing to? Um, is it the intertubular groove? It's that groovy tubular groove. That's right, an intertubular groove. And it looks like a distinct line dividing those two tubercles up. And you're going to see that more prominently on your external rotations in your AP humeri versus the internal. But you can see that very distinct line. That's your intertubular groove or bicipital groove, if you want to use that term. Now, let me go to A here. So remember I described that really round shape on the humerus? What do you think A is referring to? Okay. The head of the humerus. The head of the humerus. That's what fits into that joint space, that ball and socket joint. It literally looks like a ball going into a socket. Now, how about E? E made a straight line here, and it's talking about that anatomy that's right below that head. What was that, guys? The anatomic neck. The anatomic neck. Very good. The anatomic neck. So if that's the anatomic neck, what do you think F's referring to? Uh, surgical neck. The surgical neck, that's correct. And then G would be the shaft. If you want to be super specific, that's approximately where that deltoid tuberosity would be. But I will say when it comes to x-rays, guys, you can make note, I will not have you label the deltoid tuberosity because it's also visible to see on x-rays. If I'm pointing to this area where G is, I just expect you to put the shaft of the humerus. So you can see the difference there, guys, where those necks are located. We have our tuberosities side by side with the groove in between and the head of the humerus at that most proximal portion of that humerus fitting into that nice socket joint, which does anybody want to take a guess of what that joint is called? Does anybody read ahead? If you're having trouble with joints, think of the two bones coming together. What do you think that joint space is called? AC joints. Can you repeat the question? So you only get to hear it once. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm running out of steam. Scapulohemoral joints. Like, cor correct, Asias. And I, I was asking what the joint space was called, Tracy, um, on that location there where the humerus is fitting into the scapular area. That is the scapulohemoral joints. And that specifically, that head of the humerus fits into a cavity that we call the glenoid fossa. We're going to go over that here in a little bit, too, the glenoid fossa. And man, you know, I think we all know, I mean, right close to that joint is this really awesome piece of anatomy that I always like to talk about. I mean, you guys don't know what that is. I mean, I haven't, I, I haven't talked about that thing at all, right? Does it ring any bells? Coracoid process. The, the coracoid process, correct. And that coracoid process, you can palpate on your shoulder, guys. It's right here where I'm putting my finger with that protrusion. That is your coracoid process. That's an important landmark to palpate because when it comes to positioning, we often look for that coracoid process and bring our central ray down depending on what we're looking at. So very prominent little landmark you can actually feel yourself quite well. 
Okay, so let's move to the clavicle now, guys. The clavicle, though small, has quite a bit of anatomy, as you can see. So we're going to start all the way on the medial aspect of that clavicle. So this shape right here, it looks like a trapezoid. That's the very top of our sternum. If you remember, that's the manubrium area of that sternum with that jugular notch right on top. You can palpate that jugular notch right on your neck. That's what we're talking about. Now, as we go from the sternum and we start moving laterally, we're going to name some of this anatomy. So we're moving lateral while we name this anatomy. The first thing we have is the joint space that is connecting the clavicle to the sternum. Remember what I said, when you're trying to come, come, um, come up with those names for the joints, always think about what two bones are there. We have a sternum and we have a clavicle. Therefore, that joint is called the sternoclavicular joint, and it does have a nice abbreviation. Always love those abbreviations. You can simply abbre abbreviate that one to the SC joint. SC joint. That is acceptable. Now, the clavicle has two distinct ends to it. The end that is closest to the sternum, close to that joint, guess what that's called? The sternal end, because it's the closest to the sternum. The sternal end or the sternal extremity. I prefer to say sternal end, by the way. I find it to be a little easier to remember, but you can also say sternal extremity. Now, just like all of our long bones, that mid portion that is long on that clavicle will be called the body or the shaft. We're going to continue moving lateral down the line here until we get to the other end of the clavicle. Now, it's right next to a piece of anatomy that's called the acromion. Therefore, that end of the clavicle is what we call the acromial end or the acromial extremity. Extremity or end, you can use either term. I still prefer to say end. So as we keep moving a little more lateral, once again, we have another joint. So the clavicle is in between two joints. That medial joint is that sternoclavicular joint or SC joint. On the lateral end of the, of the um, clavicle, we have the acromioclavicular joints, because it's right next to the acromion. That can also be simplified to initials to state that as the AC joint. So you have an SC joint and an AC joint. The SC joint connects the clavicle to the sternum. The AC joint connects the clavicle to the acromion. And like I just said with the acromion, the acromion is right there on that lateral aspect of the scapula hanging over. It kind of looks like a little candy cane right here. And it's connecting that clavicle to the scapula via the AC joint. Now, don't mix it up with the coracoid process. Coracoid process is right here going forward. They do look very similar in shape. They both curve. And acrom the acromion is right next to the clavicle. The coracoid process is below the clavicle on that superior aspect of the scapula. And that's the one you can actually palpate on your shoulder. It points right towards the humerus, as a matter of fact. It's like it's pointing to the joint, like a finger pointing to it. So, I mean, it looks like a finger pointing to it. So that would be our main anatomy for our clavicles. And do make note, guys, I mean, we can't see it on this image, but we obviously will have a left and right on this anatomy with everything we're talking about. Same with the humerus. So if I was pointing to the SC joint right here, you want to make sure you're telling me that's the left SC joint. That's the left AC joint, the left body of the clavicle, so on and so forth. So we still got to make sure we're stating those sides on um, when we're making the orientation of that anatomy. Ooh, Coca-Cola is touching the soul today. Feels good on my raspy throat. And that's what it would look like on a lovely clavicle x-ray, guys. So let's see how you do. Let's see how I do. Not, not a whole lot to name here yet, but let's go with A. What's A going to be, guys? As a joint. The SC joint. The SC joint, which stands for what? What's the full name on that? Sternoclavicular joint. Sternoclavicular joint. So let's move to B. We're going to keep moving lateral here. What would B be referring to on the clavicle? Can I take a dead guess? Sternal end? The sternal end. Sternal end or the sternal extremity. Sternal end or sternal extremity. So what about C? C's referring to that mid portion of the clavicle right here. The body. The body or the shaft. We're going all the way lateral to the other end here. 
what would D be referring to? A chromian end. The acromial end, or uh, I'm sorry, acromial end. The acromial end. E would be what then? E is that last joint on the lateral aspect. Chromian clavicular joint. Chromial clavicular joint or the AC joint. You are correct. Good. Good. Making sense so far? Good. Mr. Donaldson, you said this would be the left side, correct? This would be a left, yes. So that's, and that's a good point. Once again, make sure you're specifying. If I have an x-ray that looks just like this, C would be the body of the left clavicle. B would be the sternal end of the left clavicle. And yes, I see there's no marker, but I will make sure there is a marker on your x-ray. So you will need to put that side. But this is most likely a left because of the orientation of the body, unless that was a tech that flipped it for some reason. That's most likely a left. By the way, did anyone see some of the artifacts in that x-ray? Doesn't that ring a bell from last semester? There's a prominent artifact on that x-ray. It's really bugging me. Mr. Donahue, where is it? Well, I was waiting to see if you'd tell me. My eyes, it's not as sharp. There's clothing artifacts right here on the shoulder. See those streaks? It's most likely clothing artifacts on the patient. You'll, you'll, you'll learn to see it. You'll start seeing all that. Okay, let's talk about the scapula now, guys. Now, scapula is going to have quite a bit more anatomy than the other parts. There's a lot more than people expect there to be. Now, when we talk about the scapula in particular, it has three very prominent borders upon it. We have what's called the superior border, the medial border, border, and the lateral border. Obviously, talking about the size and orientation of those borders on the body. Now, when we talk about the medial and lateral borders, they have interchangeable names, much like everything else. The medial border can also be called the vertebral border. Why is it called that? Because that side of the scapula is closest to our vertebral column. Versus the lateral border can also be called the axillary border because it's close to the axillary area, which is basically our armpit. The armpit area is often referred to as the axilla, so that would be the axillary border. <clears throat> And that's what we see on this image down here. The superior border is going to be the most superior portion of the scapula. It's got a straight line going across right here. The medial border is going right down the side on the medial portion of that scapula. And then that lateral border is closer to the humerus and the armpits. You've got your nice line going there forming that border. Now, make note that those are called borders because we also have angles on the scapula. that are labeled accordingly as well. And most often, people will actually confuse the angles between the borders. With that being said, let's go ahead and label some of this on this x-ray, because we actually have borders and angles labeled, though I haven't shown you the border. I'm sorry, the angles yet. So if I was to ask you, let's see, we haven't went over that one yet either. I'll tell you that in a second. First off, A is pointing to the, a is pointing to the acromion up here. Here's our AC joint. Here's our clavicle. C is actually pointing to that superior border. Superior border is going to be the hardest one to see on an x-ray. So more than likely, well, I won't say more than likely, I'll just tell you straight up. If I'm asking you to label the borders on a scapula, you're going to prominently see the borders without there being a line drawn around it. And I found some pretty x-rays where you can make out the borders very well. But where C is pointing to right now would be the general area where that border would be located. Let me show you. This is the superior border right here, where I'm drawing that red line. Now D, you see how the superior border moves medially and comes to a point? D is going to be referring to the superior angle. So the areas where the scapula comes to a point is what we call an angle. The straight lines are going to be the borders. So make sure you're careful on that because people often mix up the borders versus the angle. So D would be the superior angle of the scapula. We move down on this medial side. We have the medial border. 
the scapula. So let me ask you this, talking about angles, F is coming to a point once again. It's all the way down at the bottom. What do you think F would be called? Just, just a while. Do your angle. Did you look in your book? No. Okay, I'm just making sure. Good job. Good job. Setting it before, but hey, it's at the bottom. That's correct. That would be the inferior angle. Then moving back to that lateral side, guys, where we got that nice semi straight line going, that's going to be your lateral border or axillary border. Now, H here is referring to that joint space, which is that scapulohemoral joint. And we're going to specify in a second, uh, much like with the other areas of anatomy, I'm going to tell you if I'm looking for a joint or a landmark. Where H is pointing, if I'm asking for a joint, that would be the scapulohumoral joint. If I'm asking for a landmark, it's going to be what we call the glenoid fossa. Glenoid fossa. And you can see it pointing here as well, guys, on this little diagram. Right here, it's pointing to the joint, the scapulohumoral joints. But if I said I want to know what landmark that is, you tell me the glenoid fossa. Glenoid fossa. People often mix those two up as well. So make sure you know whether I'm looking for the joint or the landmark. And that's a very ugly x-ray, by the way. I'm going to give you a much prettier x-ray than that on your actual tests. Your book often has some of the ugliest x-rays I've ever seen, to be honest. They would not pass my inspection if I was sending films to the radiologist. Let's just put it that way. All right, so here's a lot of this anatomy once again, guys, on a diagram. Let's start at the very top once again, where you see this straight line going across. That's what we just talked about. That's that superior border. And that does come to a point at that superior angle. Now, right here, between the coracoid process, the superior angle, uh, superior border is a little indentation that dips down. It makes a notch. So that's what we're going to call the scapular notch. It literally looks like a notch. It's right there on the superior aspect of that scapula, the scapular notch. Now, if you look here at the front surface of this scapula, as a whole, this entire section of the scapula is going to be what we call the body, the blade, the wing, or the ala. So scapula gets all this extra attention, where it has four different names that we can call that area of the scapula. All four of those would be acceptable. I find the easiest to remember to be body, but you can use blade, you can use wing, you can use ala. All four of those would be correct terms. Make sure you do know all four pieces of terminology for that area. It kind of looks like a wing, so you might want to use wing. It looks like you got wings on the back of it a little bit, little, little fairy wings, pixie wings, kind of. And that's also that medial border, guys, once again. That line going down, that's that medial border on the edge. When we talk about that body area, it's talking about this entire section of the scapula, that entire triangular area. Now, the center of that triangular area of the scapula is going to be what we call the costal surface or the subscapular fossa. We can go by both names, costal surface or subscapular fossa. It's that central portion of this triangular blade or wing. For the inferior angle at the very bottom where it comes to a point, moving up on the edge here, it's that medial, I'm sorry, that lateral border once again. Now the scapula, much like other body parts, has a neck. The neck of the scapula is right next to the glenoid fossa or scapulohemoral joint. If you move medial, from the scapular, um, sorry, if you move medial from the glenoid fossa or cavity, that's going to be where the neck of your scapula is located. And then right underneath the glenoid fossa is going to be the actual head of the scapula. Very hard to see on an x-ray of those two. If I asked you to label them, I'd focus on the neck. The head is almost impossible to see on an x-ray. Do know that it's there. You can see the neck very clearly, though. And right there's what I was talking about. That's where the head of the humerus fits, by the way. Let's give you some perspective. That's where your humerus fits. In that little slot, that's the glenoid cavity or fossa. If I'm asking for the joint, that's the uh, scapulohumoral joint. And then if you move more superior up here, there's that acromion. 
if you remember, the clavicle connects right here and goes across the body over here. That would be our AC joint right there where it connects. So most of this anatomy we can see quite clearly on an x-ray with the exception of the head of the scapula that's very hard to see. We can see the neck quite well. So do make note also, this is what we call the anterior view of the scapula. If I was looking at a, if a person was standing AP against a, um, against the board, taking a external shoulder, internal shoulder, whatever, we're looking at that anterior view of that scapula. This is the front of the scapula in anatomic position. Because next we're going to go to the posterior view. And what's nice about the posterior view, there's much less to look at here. So we got five main pieces of anatomy. So we're flipping that. We're flipping that anatomy around. We're looking at it from behind now. There's where our chromium is, where the clavicle connects. Going across the posterior aspect of the scapula, we have this really prominent line right here. So we're going to call it the crest of the spine of the scapula. You will not see this on an x-ray, by the way. It's only going to be on a diagram. Crest of the spine of the scapula. Above that crest is what we call the supraspinous fossa. It's like a little indentation on the superior aspect of the scapula. If we look at the back of the scapula, we have what's called the infraspinous fossa. And then as a whole, this entire section from the back is going to be called the dorsal surface or the posterior surface. Great thing to know is, even though we got to know this anatomy on a diagram, none of these things that I just named right here will be viewable on an x-ray. So we need to know it for the diagram but not for an x-ray. Most of the anatomy on the anterior view, though, we can see on x-ray. Sure you do know that. So just for fun, though, if I was to ask you, what's this side here called? This straight line going across, what is that? Um, medial border? Is it the medial border? Oh, superior border. I don't know. No, no, medial. Medial, medial, medial. Lateral. Mm. Right. It is the medial. It is the medial. It's the medial border. What's this down here that's coming to a point? Inferior angle. What's this side? Lateral. Lateral border. And the top? Superior. Superior border with the superior angle. Correct. Good. So don't let that mess you up because that does flip around if we're looking at an interior versus posterior. Now we do have some of the same anatomy when we're looking at a lateral view. Some of you guys in clinic may have seen this done. This is what we call a Y shot, basically. We'll do a Y shot x-ray, which is a lateral scapula. Why is it called a Y shot? Because it kind of looks like a Y. See the Y? This is if I was looking directly at the scapula from that joint space, because there's our glenoid cavity. I'm looking straight at it. It's going to put that scapula in a lateral view. There's our coracoid process going anterior. There's our chromium at the very top, our spine of the scapula, which you want to see on an x-ray. But we do have the different sides of the scapula here that we will view. You have your dorsal surface on the left here, your ventral surface on the right, which that would be the anterior surface here, dorsal versus ventral. And then we have our lateral border superimposed upon the body of that scapula right here, coming down to a point at that inferior angle. We'll notice the only angle we'll be able to visualize in a lateral view is the inferior angle because the superior angle will be superimposed. We can't see it. But we can see that lateral axillary border superimposed upon the main body of the scapula 
we can also make out that dorsal surface versus that ventral surface on the scapula. Also can clearly see that coracoid, your chromium, and that glenoid fossa. We'll see what that looks like on an x-ray here in a minute. So most of this we will see on an x-ray quite well. This is actually an exact duplication of what one of the x-ray views will look like on an x-ray film. All right, take five minutes, guys. I gotta get my voice a rest for five minutes here. And then we will wrap up today and get you to your weekend. Take five minutes, we'll start right back at 225.
All right, guys, I am back. Hang in there. Just a few more minutes. We're going to wrap this up. Sorry. It's okay. So here's some of the anatomy that we were just discussing in that lateral view, that lateral view of the scapula on that diagram. This one right here. So this is a typical Y-shot X-ray that you see right here, although this is a badly positioned Y-shot X-ray. Why? Because they're actually clipping some anatomy down here on the bottom. I do not like that at all. You're not supposed to do that. But here's just showing some of that anatomy we just reviewed. Over here on the most lateral aspect of that scapula is our acromion. We go to the medial side over here. There's our coracoid process. Looks very similar from the AP view where it's curling forward. D right here, this little attachment that looks like two lines going across. That's going to be our scapular spine. And this main portion here, that whole long thing that looks like a blade, that's going to be our, um, I'm sorry, our body of our scapula. And then C, that most inferior aspect comes to a point would be that inferior angle of the scapula. And same thing like I talked about before, there will be markers on your exam. If that was a left, you would say the left coracoid process of the scapula, the left acromion of the scapula, the left body of the scapula, the left inferior angle of the scapula, so on and so forth, being as specific as possible. And other things I can name on here, by the way, guys, at the very top here, we've got that joint. That's where that AC joint is, by the way. A little hard to see, but you'd be able to clearly see it on the x-ray I give you. That's where that AC joint would be located. There's the shaft of our humerus. They have the humerus brought across the body right here. And that round shape right there that's superimposed on top of the scapula, that's going to be the head of our humerus. You can visualize that as well. Nice round circle is the head of our humerus. So this is that x-ray we just looked at a second ago. But I'm not going to tell you anything now. I want you to tell me. Let's review this x-ray. Is it AP scapula? Let's start all the way at the letter A. I want you to tell me what the letter A is. It's a bone. Maybe a joint. The acromion. The acromion. Now, it's not labeled with a letter. What's that little space there called medially to the acromion? Right here. Is that the AC joint? Is the, that is the AC joint. You are correct. So let's see. B, what is B referring to? It's that area right behind the glenoid fossa right here. Coracoid? Hello? Not coracoid. Not coracoid. Coracoid's right here. Looks a little funny. The coracoid's right here. This is a little hard to see. Is that the neck? That's going to be the neck of the scalp, correct. So our glenoid fossa is right here, guys, and right medial to it. It's going to look like it's a little superimposed on the rest of that anatomy. It's going to be the neck of the scapula. Coracoid specifically is going to curve over right here. All you have is that curvy shape, that protrusion. And this is an ugly x-ray. I would make sure that it's a much clearer x-ray if I'm asking you to label any of that. We'll do some practice images on that. Don't worry. Don't worry. So C, guys, C is referring to this area that's going straight across on the scapula here. What would that be? The shaft. You said the shaft? Wait. So we're talking about the scapula. Be careful. Superior border. Superior border. And what would D be? D is coming to a point. Superior angle. Superior angle. Let's keep following it around. What is E? Lateral border. Medial border. Medial border. Medial border. So be medial. careful. Medial, medial. Border. medial border is towards the sternum. Lateral is towards the humerus. So medial border. Moving inferiorly, coming to a point once again. What would F be referring to? The distal angle. Inferior angle. So, the in, so it would be the inferior angle. Good guess. Good guess. I mean, it is moving distally away, but 
that's technically referred to as the inferior angle, this is inferior aspect of that scapula. Then G, of course, will be that lateral border. And then H, I told you it's the adenoid fossa, if I'm looking for a landmark. But what if I asked what joint that was? What would you tell me? What joint would H be referring to? Scapulohumeral. Scapulohumeral joint. You are correct. You are correct. Oops. So this is the same image once again that we looked at just a second ago. Now let's see how we do on our anatomy. And that's the position there on the right, by the way. Is that Y shot X-ray lateral scapula? What would A be referring to? In that lateral view of the scapula. It's a whole section right here. Do you hear about a head? No. The chromium? The chromium. The chromium, yes. So B, what is B? I can guarantee that's going to be labeled quite a bit for you. I've only mentioned it a dozen times. Coronary process? For, for a coid process. Coracoid. So when there are coronoids in the elbow, on the ulna, coracoid is on the scapula. So D is referring to this little thin area, this little connection point. What would D be? Glenoid fossa? You say process? Glenoid fossa. So not glenoid fossa, so that's one thing to make note of. You're not going to see the glenoid fossa on the lateral view. It's, it's superimposed. You're not going to be able to visualize it well. You'll only see it on a diagram for a lateral view. It's technically right here, but it's so superimposed, you're not going to be able to see it on the x-ray. This little connection point here at these points is the scapular spine. Scapular spine. So E, we have this dotted line going down. That's a piece of anatomy that's superimposed upon other parts of anatomy, but what would E be referring to? The lateral border. The lateral border of that scapula, correct. And then finally, C is what? Inferior angle. Inferior angle of the scapula. Good. Good. So this is another view sometimes we will do of shoulders. This is what we call an inferior superior axial shoulder. We're not going to go over the positioning aspects as of yet. This is a kind of, uh, to show you that we can see a lot of different anatomy of that shoulder area. If you want to know what we're looking at, we're shooting the x-ray like so, where the patient's laying on their back, and we're shooting the x-ray through their armpit, essentially. To get a better view of that joint space overall. So we help us see that scapular femoral joint open a little better. Some of the anatomy we can see very clearly is, of course, the coracoid process. We always see that coracoid very predominantly. That glenoid fossa is right here next to the head of that humerus. Head of the humerus, of course, is that circular portion you see right here. And one key note on this view in particular, big star, when we do this view, the lesser tubercle is clearly in profile. We do not see the greater tubercle. We only see the lesser tubercle in profile. So you'll notice it does look a little similar to the greater tubercle when it's in profile. But in particular, on this view, we are only visualizing that lesser tubercle in profile. This right here is showing the acromion, which is superimposed upon the humerus. I would not have you label that in this view because that is superimposed right on the head of the humerus. I would rather you label the actual head of the humerus there. And the surgical neck is right underneath the head of the humerus, right here, the most fractured area. And there's that scapular spine right there going across the blade of that scapula, right underneath the humerus. Now this view here too, guys, you can go ahead and make note of this. I'm gonna bring this up when we get to positioning. This view in particular is often done whenever a um, technologist cannot acquire a Y-shot X-ray. So that lateral scap that we just looked at, whenever that can't be acquired normally, the tech will often do this one. Because the main reason that we do those Y-shots is not particularly to look at the scapula, but to look for dislocation of the humerus in the scapulohumeral joints. So those lateral scapulas, those Y-shot X-rays, are more than, often, more than often done to view dislocation of the humerus from the scapula. 
So this would be the alternative to the Y shot if we could not get a Y shot patient. It'll also show us that that humerus is dislocated. Very common injury. I think Naomi shared that story already, but she said that she helped her partner get his shoulder back in the, uh, his humerus back into the socket. It came out of socket. That happens to a lot of people. A lot of people. Very common injury. So just pop it right back in there. So Naomi, next time you got to do that, I hope you don't have to do that, but you can say, all right, hold tight. I got to get the head of your humerus back into that glenoid fossa. Don't move. Now use those fancy words. You probably won't be very, uh, probably wouldn't be very humored by that, I'm guessing. But <laughs> Worth a shot, you know. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the joints here, guys. We did name the three joints. There are three main joints in the shoulder girdle. Of course, that's the SC joint, sternoclavicular, AC joint, acromioclavicular, and the scapulohumeral joints. Now, do make note, you can abbreviate the two on top, that SC and AC, but you cannot abbreviate scapulohumeral, so you would not put the SH joint. That does not exist. You do have to write the entire word out on scapulohumeral joints. You do see there are some alternative names down there. Once again, that is acceptable. So if it's easier for you to just say simply shoulder joint, that is considered an acceptable term. Shoulder joint, very easy to remember that one. Or glenohumoral if you want to be really fancy. Most commonly used would be scapulohumoral, but I'm sure most of you would not oppose calling that the shoulder joint. A little easier to remember that. <clears throat> And it's just showing those joints on an x-ray one more time. We already looked at this image. There's your AC joint at the very top, your scapulohumeral right between the head of the humerus and the glenoid fossa, and, of course, your sternoclavicular or SC connecting that medial aspect or sternal end of the clavicle to the sternum in the central portion of the body. Now, do make note, these joints do fall under the categories of synovial and diarthroial. So you remember those, by the way. Those joints will be classified as synovial and diarthroneal. These are going to have those nice free range of movement. Okay, so bring it down just a little bit further here, guys, when we talk about the scapulohumoral. If you remember, that's going to be that spheroidal or ball and socket joint. It has that nice 180 degree movement. The sternoclavicular and the acromioclavicular both fall under the classification of plane or gliding joints. Plane or gliding joints. So easiest way for that scapulohumeral, guys, you just visualize what that looks like. It literally does look like a ball going into a socket. Therefore, we do call it the ball and socket joints. And spheroidal, sphere refers to something that is circular. They have the humerus is very circular. So it also could be called a spheroidal joint. And one way I remember the other two guys, if you look at the clavicle, it's considered a plane or gliding joint. I always feel like the clavicle kind of, if you have both of them side by side, they look like the wings of a plane, like you're flying or gliding. That's your plane or gliding joints. Easiest way to remember that. So if you're having trouble remembering, you know, just put your arms out like this, pretend you're flying, it's going to come to you. It works, I'm telling you. You have those brain freezes, that little stuff like that works. So what kind, guys? I just said this. What is the classification for the scapulohumeral joints? Plane. For the scapulohumeral? Plane, B. For scapulohumeral? Wait, no, 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 no. D. Oh, D. Yes, the ball, ball and socket or spheroidal. So I did that. I wasn't trying to be mean. And that's, I mean, I, it was really tricky going to that question right away, but it's showing you, even though that joint's kind of easy to remember, it's easy to mix it up with the other two. Be careful. 
clavicle joints are going to be your plane and gliding. The humerus and scapula, scapular joint is going to be that ball and socket or spheroidal joint. Very careful. Very easy to mix that up. Okay, so this is showing you again, guys. We looked at this at the, at the beginning. When we look at an x-ray, when we have the patient in that external rotation, that AP proximal humerus or AP external rotation, we do primarily, once again, see the greater tubercle in profile, which we see labeled by A here. The lesser tubercle will be superimposed on the interior aspect. And then right in the middle, where you see that nice, clear line. That's an intertubular groove, once again. And this is when we have the epicondyles parallel to our IR, much like we would have the patient positioned for an AP elbow. That's how we achieve that greater tubercle being in that lateral profile by making sure that we have those epicondyles of the elbow area parallel to the IR in a true AP position. And that does change once again when we go to that internal rotation. We'll show what that looks like as well because we change what anatomy is in profile. So this is that internal rotation. So easiest way to remember, guys, let me show a comparison here. So like I said, when we go to an internal rotation, we're going to have the lesser tubercle in profile. So the lesser tubercle is labeled by B on this radiograph. Also make note, the lesser tubercle is going to be medial. Let me go back. The greater tubercle is going to be lateral. So if you see this nice prominent protrusion here on the lateral side of that um, humerus, you know for sure that's an external rotation. When I go to this image, we have that nice protrusion on the medial side towards the scapula. That's the lesser tubercle. That tells you that's an internal rotation. Easiest way to tell the difference between those. And of course, on the internal rotation, it reverses basically. So the greater tubercle becomes superimposed on the anterior surface of the humerus. Now, on the internal rotations, that intertubular groove typically disappears. You're only typically going to see that intertubular groove on the external rotations that we see right here. Every once in a while you might see on an internal, but it's gonna be much more prominent on the external rotations. Main thing to remember between those two is what tubercle is in profile. External, the greater, internal, the lesser. The lesser tubercle in profile is on the medial side. The greater tubercle in profile will show up on the lateral side. And whatever tubercle is in profile, the opposite one will be on the anterior surface of the humerus superimposed. You'll never see both tubercles at the same time on these x-rays. And the way we do achieve that lesser tubercle being in profile comes down to the positioning on that internal rotation in comparison to the external rotation where we have the epicondyles parallel to the IR. When we do the internal rotation and we put the lesser tubercle in profile, the epicondyles are superimposed and perpendicular to our IR, like we see right here where that dot is. So epicondyles are perpendicular to the IR in the internal rotation, but they're parallel to the IR in the external rotation. Some very important facts to make note of. I'm out of voice juice, so I'm almost out of steam, guys. We're going to be wrapping up soon. <laughs> now, every once in a while, there will be a, what we call a oblique proximal humerus or a neutral rotation. This is typically not done unless the patient absolutely cannot rotate their arm at all into an internal or external rotation. This is what we call a neutral rotation. Now, what's unique to this position here? In this position, the neutral rotation, which means we have the arm just by the sides, resting against our side, like you see the lady here in the x-ray picture. Both of those tubercles will not be in profile. 
They'll both be superimposed on the anterior surface of that, of that humerus. So in a neutral rotation, we do not visualize either tubercle at all because neither is in profile. A and B is giving you the approximated locations of where those are, but we will not clearly see them in the neutral rotation. That's why this is not a preferred method, by the way, because the radiologist really will see both of those tubercles. So what, this is why we will do that external and internal rotation on that shoulder series. The epicondyles, the way they sit, they will actually be in a 45 degree angle to the IR, which is why it's sometimes called a oblique proximal humerus. But the more common name would be what we call neutral rotation, because they're simply resting their arm by the side because the patient cannot turn their hands or rotate the humerus due to pain, fracture, dislocation, all the above, whichever one that is. Keynote, once again, neither tubercle will be in profile in the neutral rotation x-ray. <clears throat> Okay, so if I showed you these three x-rays, three x all side by side, could you identify those by position? Neutral. Let's start with the letter B. Externally rotated. What are we looking at on the letter internal? B? What position is that? External? Internal? So that's internal. So... Defending your answer, why do we know that's an internal rotation on B? It's right in the middle here. A greater to shown, uh, right? You said the greater shown? B? Try again, try again. Wait, or is it the lesser? B is the lesser. So for internal rotation, we have that lesser tubercle in profile which is protruding medially inward. That's our lesser tubercle. So this tells us this is an internal rotation. So if I go over here to A, this anatomy right here is what's in profile. So first off, what is that? What is that anatomy that's in profile on A? The greater tubercle. The greater tubercle. So therefore, if that's in profile, what position would this be? The AP. Um... AP shoulder. AP shoulder with what kind of is that AP rotation or no rotation? I know we haven't really done positioning yet, but we gotta start getting this concept. Is it no rotation? The external. The external rotation. External rotation. So it's gonna all we're gonna go over this again with the positioning part of the lecture. But the way we achieve that greater tubercle in profile is by externally rotating the hand. So that's gonna tell us that's a, an external rotation because that greater tubercle is clearly in true profile. Versus B, the lesser tubercle is in true profile. So that tells you that's an internal rotation. And of course C, I can't see either tubercle in profile, so what would that be? Neutral, I think you called it oblique. Oblique. Exactly, neutral or oblique proximal humerus. Neutral. So no rotation is present at all on C. Definite concept to start, making sure you memorize, guys. Uh, that's going to come back a lot. That's one of those things the registry likes to ask as well. Make sure with these three radiographs, you can tell what position each of those are, what anatomy is in profile or not in profile. We're going to practice that more moving on, though. That's not making a lot of sense now. We'll do some more practice images. See how much time we have here. Got a little bit more time here. Let's just do this image and we'll call it a day, guys. So it depends on how fast you're going to get through it. So we have a nice view of a shoulder here with some nice labeled anatomy. So I want to know what is A? A, a chromial end? A chromial end of what? The clavicle. Of the clavicle. 
acromial end of the clavicle, right here. This clavicle is all the way up here. It's one of the most superior thing to see. So what would be the what would be B then? What is B? Acromion. The acromion. What about this joint in between A and B? AC joint. AC joints. What is C? Coracoid. Coracoid, yeah. A little too many O's and I's there, but yes, coracoid. Coracoid process specifically. And coracoid process of the scapula, to be more specific. Make sure we specify. G is referring to this straightened area right here. Superior border. Superior border. Correct. So what is F if I was asking for a landmark? The glenoid fossa. Glenoid fossa or cavity. What if I was asking for a joint? The glenohumeral joint or the scapulohumeral joint. Very good. Or if you just want to say shoulder joint, that's acceptable as well. Yes. All right. So this is a great one. What is D? Lesser typical. Greater. Lesser. The greater. So so make sure, guys. I keep I keep hearing some mix up on that. You're only going to see the lesser tubercle on the medial side if it's in profile. You'll only see the greater tubercle on the lateral side if it's in profile. So the greater tubercle is in profile here. What does that tell you about what position this is? So we just talked about. It's externally rotated. Externally rotated, exactly right. So what about this line right here? We've got a nice pretty line going across. It's very groovy. Lesser tubercle. It's tubercle. So that's not groove. Yeah. Intertubular groove. Intertubular groove. Intertubular groove. Intertubular groove will look like that prominent line that you see there, guys. And you're only going to see that typically on an external rotation shoulder. And being that this is external rotation, even though the lesser tubercle is about right here, it's superimposed. We can't clearly see it. This is the approximated location of that lesser tubercle. If the lesser tubercle was in profile all the way over here, that greater tubercle would disappear. We're going to practice that more. We'll practice that a lot more. See, so we need to go back and review that. Okay, so the rounded portion of the humerus here, what's that called? Is that Tom Golden? Is that the head? The head, yes. So someone said this answer just now. So this line going across underneath the head is? Anatomical neck. Anatomical neck. And this arrow should be a little bit further over, but what area of the humerus is this? Surgical neck. What about the long portion of the humerus? Shaft. Shaft. And what about this edge right here? That is the lateral border of the scapula. The medial? It's, it's lateral. Lateral or the scapula. It's closest to the humerus. The medial so, is closer to the sternum. Okay. Okay. All right, that's about everything on that one. Okay, guys, we will go ahead and stop right there now. See your brains have about had it. See it on your faces. You're just saying, please, for the love of God, someone stop him. Someone stop him. Can't take any more. All right, guys, so start reviewing that anatomy. If you do remember, I gave you guys some homework to acquire Play-Doh. Please bring your Play-Doh on Monday. We're going to do a project for anatomy once again and make a competition out of it for bonus points. So do not forget that. you got the whole weekend to acquire a, a little container of Play-Doh. Go to Walmart. It's 50 cents for each little tub of it. Very, very cheap. So get you some, and we will finish up anatomy and do that activity, and then start getting into the positioning aspects of the shoulder girdle. Are there any questions about what we talked about today? All right, and I will acquire, when we get a little more into the x-rays, some practice images for you guys to help prepare for that next image review. If you have any questions, as always, please let me know, and I will send you guys the PowerPoint as soon as I get off of the um, WebEx call here. So have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Stay dry, stay safe, and I will see you guys bright and early on Monday. Have a good one. I will see you soon. Bye-bye.